K4. Uh, so I have the distinct honor of uh, introducing uh, this, uh, this panel. Uh, uh, John Neffel uh, is an independent journalist covering national security and civil liberties. He's the co-host of Radio Dispatch, uh, a daily political podcast um, by BTR, uh, and is a, a researcher for The President Show, premiering on Comedy Central on April 27th. And uh, now I also um, have uh, the pleasure of uh, <clears throat> introducing Zainab Tufeshi. She's a, an associate professor, new, uh, 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 new title, um, uh, at the University of North Carolina, uh, and a faculty associate at the Harvard Berkman uh, Klein Center for Internet and Society. She's also a contributing opinion writer at the New York Times. Her new book, Twitter and Tear Gas, comes out this year from Yale University Press. And uh, um, Zainab has the distinct honor of being, uh, uh, the, well, I think, one of the only people to present at all seven theorizing the webs. Uh, and we really, really uh, cherish and, and appreciate uh, her contributions to the, to the conference. So uh, take it away. to uh, all of the organizers and to all of you for coming out here today. Um, I think this is going to be a really interesting discussion. The book is is really, really great. Um, and I certainly recommend it to all of you. And it, just briefly, uh, it examines the complex interplay between contemporary social movements and the technology that helps facilitate, uh, amplify, and in many ways structure uh, these movements. And what's really um, fascinating about the book is that it doesn't ever reduce the social movements that we're seeing to a sort of technological reduction, right? I think we've all probably read uh, op-eds that refer to the Twitter revolutions or the Facebook uprisings. And this book takes a much more uh, complicated, nuanced, uh, on-the-ground look, which I think is, is really, really necessary for examining how these uh, these movements uh, happen um, in a moment-to-moment -moment, uh, basis. So, so to start off, um, I think one of the concepts that comes up repeatedly in the book is uh, this idea of affordances. And, uh, and I think that that might be a good way to, to sort of introduce how you talk about the, the interplay between what a, a platform like Facebook or a platform like Twitter allows for activists to do. Um, and I thought that, that um, this uh, example that you said in the book of Tahrir Supplies is a really uh, helpful and concrete way to understand this, this concept of affordances. Okay, so let's start there. Um, thank you for inviting me. This really is my seventh Theorizing the Web appearance. Uh, I have that distinct honor, I'm, I'm super pleased. And also, uh, yesterday my editor uh, from uh, Yale, Joe Kalemia, just showed up and said, oh look, here's the first actual real copy of your book, here you go. So this is like, this is the first time I've actually seen the book and it exists and I'm kind of flabbergasted by the fact that I open the pages and can't edit them. <laughs> <laughs> I, yesterday I was like, oh, here we go. Oh, no, I think this isn't the best word for it, and there was nothing I could do, um, which is both a relief <laughs> uh, and a bit scary. And that's kind of the affordances, right? The affordance of a paper book is not being edited, uh, whereas the digital screen, the affordance of writing on a digital device is that it can be edited. So when, why do I talk about affordances? What do I mean? Uh, let's start with sort of a theory thing. And the concern I have had uh, on this topic is technology, technology analysis um, has, I think, two distinct forms. One very common in academia and one very common in the pundit world. And both are reductionist. And I have to say, I hate to, on the one hand, on the other hand, I'm in the middle, and I'm not in the middle. That's not what I'm going to do. Uh, but I am going to delineate my approach from two separate approaches that I, we see a lot and why I use the word affordances to try to understand, and we'll get to Tahir Supplies from there. So the, the hype version, which you talk about, is the reductionist Twitter revolutions. Uh, it got to the point that my friends in the Middle East, especially in 2011, if a journalist asked them, what about your use of Twitter, they just say, Twitter, what's Twitter? We don't use it, bye. Um, 
they were so sick of the question. They were just utterly sick of constantly being asked about it. In fact, they were so sick of it, I watched them change their answers over the first few months. But if you talk to them in person, they were very acutely aware of any changes to these platforms because these platforms were really important to what they could do. Their affordances were very significant. So when Twitter's, for example, trending topic algorithm ever changes or something happens, I usually hear it, like the Bahraini activists will be like, oh wait, did you notice there might be a change? Because they are very attuned to it. So uh, the reductionist version, which gives technology these almost magical super determining powers, um, that's obviously very reductionist, and I don't need to say more. But on the other hand, I have to say I'm really not a fan of the, um, it's a tool, and tools are, you know, can be good or bad approach either. I mean, it's true, right? It's true on the one hand that it is a tool, and tools can be good or bad, but that's not really giving us much, right? Um, because, for example, I mean, this microphone is a tool, and I could plausibly hurt someone with it. It's kind of heavy, but it wouldn't really be an efficient tool to commit mass murder, right? As opposed to, say, a nuclear weapon. So tools aren't these free-floating things with no um, complexity and consequences to their design. And tools also have a materiality, and they have, um, and those materiality is partly what we think we can do the, with them, but it's partly laws of nature, physics, you know, the fact that this is heavy but sharp and blunt and, you know, doesn't have um, some other things. So affordances has become a way, it's come from, uh, it became a way of describing things that tools make easier versus they don't. It's kind of a simplistic way of looking at their complex interplay, but I do like it to explain things uh, because it avoids the, it's just a tool, which you see in some social constructivist approaches, theoretically speaking, where the both either designers or the users are given these superpowers to interpret and remake it, and I'm like, of course we see user reappropriation, but that's not infinite either. There's very real material conditions that condition. So, uh, tire supplies, I will explain to you guys. Now, I've had the, dis like this book, for me, is one of these transitional books that I've had the distinct luck or not luck of growing up in Turkey, a heavily censored regime at the time. I grew up under the shadow of the 1980 coup. And you know how Eskimos supposedly have lots of words for snow? May or may not be true. Uh, Turks have lots of words for coups. <laughs> we have <laughs> different versions of coups, and we have like, we describe them precisely. There are, you know, military coups that are hard coups, soft coups, postmodern coups, e coups. I'm not kidding. They're like all these uh, different coups. And the 1981 was a particularly hard one. Uh, full military takeover, uh, absolute censorship. So I grew up under that regime. The only thing in TV, it was a one channel we could watch, was Little House on the Prairie. That's what they showed us. It made no sense. I'm from Istanbul. There's no frontier, right? We'd be like, it's like, why is this family living in the middle of nowhere? And what is this thing called middle of nowhere? Because where I'm from, there's you know, a couple thousand years of empires. Um, but that was because of censorship, and I could not get news from rest of the country. So I grew up under that. And then I lived through you know, the internet coming to Turkey. And then I lived through sort of um, supercomputers in our pockets kind of situations. So I lived through movements both before and after uh, having this kind of connectivity. And th that's why I'm very attuned, I think, to the affordances part, because I've kind of had the sense of I, I don't agree with the view that movements are movements and nothing's changed. I think a lot of things have changed in the sense that the game, the rules of the game has changed and what you can do has changed. Movements still are movements, but there's a lot of changes. So Tahir supplies. This is um, an example I give in the book about how the affordances matter. Um, if you've ever you know, been in a protest before the internet, these supercomputers that we used to communicate with another, well, the police kind of had versions of this. They had radios, they had helicopters. They could coordinate in ways. Um, that's what militaries do also, not just police, they coordinate. And logistics is how wars are won. I, I mean, uh, if you're a history kind of person, 
I, I love reading the logistics about like World War I, World War II. It's very complex. There's, this is how wars are lost or won. Can you manage your supply chain? Can you feed you know, a million people on the field? All those things. So that, it used to take militaries. Okay. So, um, 2011, around November, uh, the, we had the initial sort of the uprising January 25, February. And then it's a tumultuous time, and lots of things are happening. And sort of cutting to directly to November, there is a resurgence of rebellion and protest movement. Uh, I'm leaving out the politics to be able to tell the story. But it is the young people, mostly, who are really frustrated with what the revolution they started is going. They're watching the military take over the country again. And clashes break out near Tahrir Square. And Tahrir Square, if you've been there, is quite large. Uh, it's not like Times Square. It's really large. And there are many roads coming uh, in and out of it. And this is happening in one of the roads that come into it um, that di lead directly to the Ministry of Interior. And Ministry of Interior, where all the horrible things happen, still uh, happen. Uh, and the clashes break out between resurgent, rebellious uh, protesters and the police. Now, these are not minor clashes. Uh, at the end of it, I believe 30 to 40, I'm not sure we had the exact number ever, but dozens of people died. So this is not you know, just uh, a few small clashes. That means, like, uh, if you can scale up, that means thousands of injured people. And from the initial Tahrir protest, these um, people had set up field hospitals. Because if you took people to... Um, you know, real hospitals, they might get arrested and sometimes you need to treat people right there. Uh, you're getting fired. Even if you're not getting t fired live bullets, you get fired tear gas canisters directly at you. Uh, huge risk. People have lost eyes. If it hits your head, it's a huge, uh, it can be fatal. Um, so there's a lot of treating that's happening. So there are 10 field hospitals. It is not easy to operate 10 field hospitals because the logistic and the supply chain these are real hospitals, you know, in some sense, except they're like right in front of the KFC <laughs> and there's like a little curtain. And what I started seeing was people retweeting the, their needs. You know, the, the KFC hospital needs betadine. It gets retweeted and then retweeted and then, you know, they have it. And you're kind of looking at it and saying, what is going on? Why is this constantly being retweeted? And do they have the betadine? Should we go get it? You know, so there was this confusion. And people 24 hours after the fact retweeting it, trying Correct. to be helpful, but Correct. Uh, Correct. just spreading information that didn't need to be there. Exactly. And if you've ever, so you've seen this, right? You sort of see something and you're like, this is from two years ago. This is how it was. So ordinarily, this is a hard problem. But Twitter's particular affordances allowed something that a couple years before that would have been really hard. So a pharmacy student who wasn't even in Cairo, who's in UAE, but as with a lot of people, he's Egyptian, he's a lot of people, young people from Egypt, he's just glued to Twitter, watching this happen, he's just seeing all these retweets. And he says, let me solve this. <laughs> so he told me the story, I'm like, you just sort of got up and said, let me solve this? He's like, yeah. <laughs> I said, okay, great. Um, do you know any history, logistics, Hitler, Napoleon, Moscow, siege? He's like, what? And I said, okay, never mind. <laughs> so five minutes later, he has a Twitter feed up. Five minutes later. It's called Tahrir Supplies. And this is where Twitter's affordance is going to play. One of Twitter's affordances that makes it sometimes annoying to use is that you can at mention anyone. Like Facebook is a mutual follow thing. If you friend someone, they have to friend you. And if they message you and they're not your friend, it goes to another folder. And I, I discover every other year, I'm like, oh, wow, there's like 30 people that message me on this alternative thing I didn't even see. Facebook doesn't make it easy for non, like, two directional connections to find you. Whereas Twitter, hey, I'm at Zainab, right? I, I, I get, <laughs> um, not only that, Zainab's a very common name. So I get like half of Zainab mentions in Turkey that come to me because mm -hmm. it's very easy uh, to mention me. And this is, you know, parenthetically why it's sometimes hard to use as a high-profile user is because it does open you up to people who don't like you. But it also means that people who don't know you can mention you. So this Tahrir Supplies, who nobody knew, you know, five minutes ago it got started, started at mentioning 
high level, high profile kind of people, hi, by high level I mean high profile people on Twitter who are on the ground saying, we're gonna solve this, we're gonna solve this, hey, look at us, we're gonna solve this. I don't remember if they en at mentioned me because I re was retweeting stuff, but we started talking very early, I can probably dig into my archive. Uh, I started like talking to them when no, like they were just a tiny little account with 10 followers or so because it's just them. The, uh, um, the person who started this found three other friends, one in Cairo and one in London and one also elsewhere. So there's only one person Cairo in the ground. And the people they were at mentioning, they're like, who are you? And they're like, look, we're gonna solve this. And some of the things Twitter allows direct messages and these people also had some Skype chats and they're like, we're gonna do this. And they set up Google document spreadsheets and they said, stop retweeting stuff, just tweet at us. Tell us who needs what and we're gonna do this. So they set up Google spreadsheets. They put them up on the web so you can, sort of, you can embed the Google spreadsheets. They had the 10 field hospitals and they had the supplies that each one needed and they started matching people to who needed what and keeping track of it and occasionally using um, phone conversations and other things to get to the people on the ground. And literally 24 to 48 hours, it was all organized. Like you could know how much surgical sewing suture stuff was in which hospital and which one needed more. Um, and it also allowed them, be the, you know, through this, and then people started just pointing at them. So if you got a request, people were like, just let Tahir Supplies handle it. They just took over the whole thing. It disappeared from my feed, no more confusion. Now this is not a minor thing, okay? This is 10, if dozens of people are dead, and if you can triage quickly, you're saving lives. They also brought, uh, because they concentrated this, they brought a crowdfunding ability. Uh, a lot of the injuries are eye injuries because the tear gas canister comes directly at your eye and there's some specialized equipment, needed $40,000, they raised it, right? You can do that because you can operate at scale. Now, after all this was, was done, I asked this young person in his 20s, I said, where'd you get the idea? Like, okay, you don't know history, I'm not gonna tell you. I usually when I interview these sort of really young, innovative people, I do ask them if they know history, if they don't, I'm like, I'm not gonna ruin this for you. <laughs> you know, <that> I'm not <laughs> they, they can find it out on their own later. Well, you know, that they, if they want to. And he says, oh, cupcakes. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Like, run this by me again? How did you get inspired by cupcakes? It's like there was this cupcake store in Cairo and they're really great going viral and you know, I saw them managing like pushing whichever cupcake was kind of, like they were managing their cupcake supply chain with Twitter. So he thought he could solve the 10 field hospital <laughs> supply chain. And like you realize this is why, you know, Napoleon didn't manage and you know, Moscow speaks Russian instead of French and always like, what? <laughs> So Twitter's particular affordances make it possible for this complete upstart little thing, along with Google spreadsheets and their embedding ability, uh, to do this. And there is really no way that I can imagine pre-internet, and especially pre you can't do this on Facebook, right? Facebook has other affordances. I don't really see how you could solve a supply chain problem. If you could, you know, Napoleon would have solved it too. So it's, it's a real problem to, just organizing the information is a real problem. So it's a sort of the story is both the capabilities, movements gained as a result of this, but if you couldn't at mention anyone at Twitter, you couldn't do this either. You see what I'm saying? Because the people who started this, four very young people, and their, their own Twitter reach was maybe 100 people, you know, they had just been doing normal stuff there. And if you couldn't retweet, you couldn't do this. And there was all these other things that went into making uh, this particular thing possible. So I, I, I try to, when I wrote these stories, uh, I have a lot of sort of these stories, I try to say, what were the particular affordances, algorithms, policies, the techno, uh, technological material um, infrastructure? The, some of it is software infrastructure, some of it is policy infrastructure. How did it interact with what these people were trying to do and who they were and what their goals were? And this is one of the examples. Well, and, and what I think is really interesting uh, about one of the early chapters in the book is, uh, is looking at the differences between 
uh, the the sort of positives and negatives that come from being able to set up a logistics operation like this so quickly, right? So in the Tahrir Supplies example, being able to solve this incredibly complicated logistics problem almost literally within five minutes and you're off the ground and running uh, is clearly a benefit to, to the movement, to the activists. Um, but you talk about... Um, that that when you when you look at things like the civil rights movement in, in the United States, that you couldn't uh, you you couldn't send an email blast to ten thousand people in one in one evening, right? You had to get people together to make flyers, to physically cut them out, to physically hand them door to door, uh, and that the the act of of doing that. Um, creates really important um, bonds within uh, an institution and an organization that that is uh, work that happens before the sort of front facing work of a boycott or of a protest and and often now the, the what you describe in the book is that we almost see the front facing protest and then the the back end is not. Uh, as robust as it would have been without these w without these affordances that, that you're talking about, and so so just so des describe a, a little bit more about the the um, the sort of upsides and downsides of having these uh, these these problems that can be solved quickly, but maybe with less depth than it would t than you'd have if if you still had to cut flyers out hand by hand. Right. Yeah. So. Um this, is, this gets really tricky because on the one hand, I just told you guys a story that sounds really empowering, and it is. Right? I want to be really clear that it is an empowering to be able to do all of this. But it turns out to be really complex, I think, in its consequences. Because an example I like to talk about is the civil rights movement, not because it's the only one that ever existed, obviously. And in fact, I was a little reluctant because it gets discussed so much. But on the other hand, it's one that lots of people know about, right? So it's a good comparison uh, to talk about the things they did. So if you look at something like the Montgomery bus boycott, right? So the elementary school version is Rosa Parks got tired. She sat down. She had enough. Little old lady. Now, obviously, that is false, right? This is like uh, you have to sort of immediately know that is false. Uh, she was a very brave activist uh, who had done a lot of things. It wasn't even her first arrest, and she wasn't even the first person to be arrested for um, defying these unjust laws. It was the sh she was instead the first test case, an organization deliberately picked to challenge. Um, and they picked her with her consent because, as you can imagine, it's a very brave thing to do, not the sitting down just, but sort of being the face of something that is facing great repression. Uh, we're talking Montgomery uh, in the civil rights era. So when they decided to do this, as you say, they couldn't just say, all right, people, you know, here's the hashtag. <laughs> you know, that's not the, how do you tell people we're going to boycott the bus because you, you hold, she, got, she gets arrested. The NAACP, the local NAACP, is waiting for a test case. And they go talk to her. They're like, do you want to do this? Because, and she paid a lot, and a lot came down on her. You know, it was not, there's no easy walk here. Uh, they're like, are you, do you want to be the person? We're going to, you know, we're going to do the boycott. Do you, are you ready for this? And she's really a tough, a brave woman. She says, yes, I'm ready. And then they go to their organization and they have this discussion, can we do this? And they're like, they're gonna do it one day. It's gonna be one day. The question is, how do you tell everyone else? <laughs> I mean, it seems really simple, but how do you tell hundreds of thousands of people don't get on the bus tomorrow? So at the time, the Montgomery bus boycott, uh, the civil rights movement in Alabama had 67 or 68 organizations Women's groups, religious groups, other groups, medical groups, everything you can think of that crisscrossed and had organized the whole city for years. Uh, this is, there's a great memoir, I love it, Joanne Robinson. Um, she, she talks about the how part. And that's what I always pay attention to. You know, when people tell you something happened, I always like to ask, how did it happen? So she stays up all night 
printing, uh, mimeographing, not printing, mimeographing flyers. Because uh, she's a college professor, she has access to that. She stays up with three students. And then there's 60 something organizations man distribute this uh, across the city. Now, one person, like her employer, finds this and it kind of makes the newspaper. So there's a complex publicity story there, which actually helps them in the end. Uh, but they manage to like talk to all these people. There's phone trees. And then they, the first day, it's very successful. And then they meet the same night. Are we doing the second day? They're doing it. They're empowered. They do it. And lasts more than a year. Now, to pull this off, you have hundreds of thousands of people, African Americans in Montgomery, pre-civil rights era. They cannot not go to work. They're not well off. They have to go to work. So, and they, they walk. A lot of them walk, but not all of them can walk. And sometimes it's not feasible. So they organize um, carpools, hundreds of cars. The cars have to be compensated. These were not talking, you know, not well off, right? So the cars have to be compensated. Donations are coming in. They have to be 100% above board. Everything has to be paperwork because there's a government, a state, a country that's coming for you. So they're literally meeting all the time <laughs> to organize all of this successfully. Now, here's the thing. I think this model of, they couldn't pull it off without having organized all of this before. Whereas right now, if you look at it, Gezi Park protests, couple days. January 25, basically a Facebook page and some, some antecedents, but not a huge amount of pre-organizing. Occupy, the same. Black Lives Matter, somewhat the same. It is not a direct continuation of NAACP or existing thing. There's a lot of sort of uh, grassroots stuff happening. And it, what happens with digital technology is the speed up, all, it's, it's a different thing. The, but the, by the time you get to something like the March on Washington, you need it to have been organizing for maybe a decade to pull it off. Whereas right now, current movements can kind of scale up really quickly couple weeks and you got, like Occupy had global marches bigger than anything, two weeks organization. On the one hand, this is a great strength. On the other hand, you scale up so fast that you don't have the kind of, uh, I, I call it network internalities because I couldn't find another word for it. Uh, I just made up a word. Um, the kind of day-to-day -day work you do with people over time and I don't mean this in a face-to-face -face versus digital thing. I mean day-to-day -day work over time. If you do it today, it would be both. It, you learn who do you trust, how do you trust, how do you delegate, how do you, and I think this is the big sort of the weakness, the fragility part, how do you make collective decisions? You work that out because you need to figure out how am I going to get all these hundreds of cars compensated. So solving that problem by Excel is fine with me, right? I'm not, I, I do not like paperwork or meetings or any of that. But that kind of intense work gave people a particular strength in knowing how to face what would come down the pike at them. Whereas I think a lot of today's movements, they scale up very fast. They have a very impressive first month and I think this might be sounding familiar now to 2017. It looks like, wow, Women's March started as a Facebook post. The problem is you don't have the collective decision-making infrastructure that can only be built through the interpersonal interaction and political organizing when the, after the protests, especially as a government wakes up and starts coming for you. So the, what I find all, over and over again in a lot of countries around the world is that it's like a startup that starts really fast and just gets a billion dollars, like billion users, and you're like quick. But instead of Facebook coming to buy you for $16 billion, you got a government coming for you. And they don't have that kind of, the, what, the, the kind of resilience you would need to take that first turn. So they're, they become very big and very vulnerable at the same time 
Whereas in the past, if you got that big, it meant you were a lot less vulnerable because to get that big, you had become really strong, whereas it's kind of twisted. So I think when you look at a current moment and you look at something like Women's March, a lot of people are thinking, you know, oh, look, it's like March on Washington. They're seeing great strength. I'm seeing great fragility. I'm like, you organize this in a month. This is really fragile. It looks the same, but I don't think the trajectory is the same. And if they're going to be strong, it's like post-protest is what matters. What do you do afterwards? Whereas in the past, I think it was what you did before. So we've had this time shift, this kind of order shift. And that's, ki that's a big theme in my book is like how these strengths and weaknesses, well, I don't want to say good or bad, but these things that are really intertwined. And that's why it's named with a Twitter poll. I couldn't find it. I, I'm not good at naming things. It's called the power and fragility. Uh, because, well, it, that won the Twitter poll, but <laughs> more like that, it's those two things that are really combined for me in these and, digital tech. And I think, I think that another um, now s seemingly y ubiquitous um, uh, thing that we, that we see with these contemporary social movements is, uh, is non-hierarchical organizing, right? And I think that, that, that everything that, that you were just talking about really um, flows into, into that because on the one hand, certainly when I started uh, reporting on Occupy Wall Street, one of the things that I found really exciting about it was that people could just go to a physical place and they would be given a task within, or just decide a task within a minute or two. And, and you had uh, people who five minutes ago weren't activists, now they are activists, and they have uh, an incredible sense of ownership over the movement, right? And you don't have to work your way up through an NGO or something to have your voice heard. So there's obviously, uh, and, and the fact that we keep seeing an insistence uh, on non-hierarchical organizing, at least for right now, s suggests that, that, that there is a clear upside to it. Uh, at the same time, as you were just talking about, there's not necessarily um, mechanisms to disagree internally, to uh, to to make decisions, uh, to make large dis decisions, and also uh, as 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 you talk about um, sometimes uh, citing an essay from the, the 19, 1970, I believe, uh, the, the the tyranny of of non yeah, the tyranny of structurelessness, that, that uh, hierarchies that already exist in society are reproduced within these movements um, without an acknowledgement of those hierarchies. So, so I'm, I'm curious um, to, to, for, for you to just to, to talk about wh why, why that seems to be such, uh, so, so ever present in these movements and uh, this, this, what, what it allows for and what it doesn't allow for. That's another fascinating intertwining, right? Because if you show people from today's movements uh, the Port Huron Statement from 1962, which is sort of this participatory, emancipatory statement of the people that ended up being really significant figures in the 68 movement, and then you show them the tyranny of uh, structurelessness, Joe Freeman, which is a critique of apparent leaderlessness, which just ends up with the aggressive people being de facto leaders. Um, it sounds very familiar, both of them. Like you could literally put the 1962 statement and you would have to change a few things. They say he all the time, so you would say he or she, because <laughs> it's 1962 and they're only men, no humans. But if you fix those things, it sounds really contemporary, which is interesting. So the participatory urge this horizontal urge, the desire to be leaderlessness, not only does it predate the internet, it doesn't just come from nowhere, right? Because if you've been in movements, you know this. Leaders can be, if you've read history, you know this. Leaders can be co-opted. They can be corrupted. They can be killed. You know, you can have the best, greatest leadership and it can be, you can, you, you're, that makes you subject to um, assassinations of leaders. These are very common problems with movements. And also, more importantly maybe, in some ways, why do you go to a protest? It's not to become like a bank teller and be told what to do, right? You're trying to have voice in society because you don't feel like you have voice in society through the institutional channels. And you go there and you wanna have a voice in society and if somebody, like there's something to do, you wanna do this. 
it is your way. Of, it's a very, I mean, movements are, uh, you know, there's a lot of theories about how protests are risky and why does anybody do it in free writing? And I am kind of like, are you kidding? They're great. Like, yes, they can be risky. I've been in you know, risky situations with many protests before, but they're very life-affirming too. You're there with people to, it's a rebellious moment. And bureaucracy and hierarchy is kind of antithetical to the, to the spirit of why people protest. But before the internet, here's let's come to the digital side of it. Before digital technology, if you really wanted to coordinate that carpool, you were gonna need some organizational structure, right? You just weren't gonna throw up an Excel spreadsheet and do it. I think what happens is with digital technologies, a very understandable pre-existing sort of dynamic that has turned into a political cultural moment, the desire to be spokes personless, the horizontalism, has become possible. You couldn't really organize 86 nation, eight, I'm sorry, uh, no, uh, 86 cities, uh, Occupy organized 86 uh, cities protests in 2011 October with just two weeks. You could not do that in a non-hierarchical kind of horizontalist way if you did not have the digital technologies that matched the sensibility. The sensibility existed, the political culture existed, now you can do it, you can get big. What I have observed again and again is that ha being able to do this leaderless, horizontalist thing doesn't solve the many issues that have come up again and again with these sort of horizontalist movements pre-internet, which is why the tyranny of structurelessness, you give it to a young activist and they're like, Wow, they had this problem in the 70s. And it's just the problem, you've seen it. I, I mean, I write about some examples. Occupies assemblies, right? The facilitators had so much power. If you watch any one of them, you can kind of tell. There is this implicit huge power being exercised. And a lot of times, I've seen it, lots of examples, the kind of person that tends up having more power in a, a non-formalized setting Surprise, surprise, it's the kind of person that has more power in the formalized setting too. <laughs> it's no shock, right? The person is assertive, aggressive, cuts you off, uh, is an extrovert. The movements are run by tons of extroverts, um, which comes with its own issues. It, um, is in a position of power usually in the non-protest thing, is used to giving orders. And if you're pretending that it's all flat, you don't have a formal mechanism of challenging it. Because the idea that it's all flat is not really true, but by pretending it, you've kind of deprived yourself of ways and tools of dealing with it. It's kind of the way some governments, the US might move to that too. Like with the new census, they want to stop measuring some issues related to race. Because if you don't measure it, you, know, you can just kind of pretend it doesn't exist. So the leaderless movement thing is very complicated. I mean, I don't want to sound like Everybody get into the sort of business of, and uh, that's not it. But the question is, obviously not, right? Uh, the question is, how do we have egalitarian structures that honor this participatory impulse, but that we can also make collective decisions and have accountability within the movement? And these are the two things that I've seen movements really kneecap because of that is lack of formal structures of accountability. By formal, I don't mean like bylaws. I mean a way in which you can seek accountability within the movement that makes sense. Creates these tensions that just blow up. People just get madder and madder and madder in each other and there's a crisis. Or collective decision making. I've seen like, the, you remember, this is sort of tying in with the thing we just talked about is that they get really big really quickly. Now you got a million people in the streets, everybody's energized, and a government's coming for you. What's next? It's a good question, what is next? There's always gotta be something next. If you look at, to give civil rights movement, they went through f at least four or five major tactical shifts that matched the challenge they were trying to put, either policy or practical, with the strengths they had, with the media attention they were seeking. There were these tac so they were tactically shifting, you know, bus boycott, and then you have lunch counters, and you have other things, and then you have a big march, and why there's these tactical shifts. Movements that survive, one way or another, make tactical shifts. In current movements, the question is, who decides? Now, 
In an ideal world, you could just say, let it emerge, except you've got a government coming for you or a counter movement coming for you. So it's that vulnerability of being unable to take collective decisions because it's so horizontalist. And then this internal tension with lack of accountability, that just ends up with people bickering on Twitter. <laughs> I mean, you've seen this. This is the kind of Twitter bickering you see in today's movements in the United States. I assure you, every other post 2009 movement I have seen has gone through this and some of them have become, I, it's not a minor thing. To have the people in your movement, especially sort of the people who have become very invested, be constantly, publicly, in a non-ephemeral setting, because it's public, and affordances matter, it's 140 characters and all of that, and there's a retweet mechanism and all of that, it really undermines the cohesiveness and the collective decision-making ability of course, you're not going to argue everything should be swept under the rug, but what is the other mechanism by which these leaderless movements seek accountability, seek to make decisions, act collectively? I think that's like the big question, because we're on commercial platforms, and they're not designed for healthy decision-making and tactical shifts by movements, but that's where we are. And that, I think, is sort of the weakest What's the correct metaphor? The underbelly? Like this is the weakest thing that gets movements and that makes them hit those walls. And it depends on where you are. Like if you're in Egypt, you know, it ends maybe with a military coup and a great deal of repression in some other countries with just movements that are disintegrating. And this is it's a very complex space. And I don't you know, I I'm I'm trying not to sound like I'm not like it's hard to not be advocating for stuff, but the advocate advocacy here isn't, you know, turn into NGOs. It's kind of like, what is the 21st century networked, participatory, egalitarian, collective decision-making mechanism that fits what movements are trying to do? And I don't think we have an answer. I don't know we how we make decisions yet. And uh, considering where we are, I wanted to um, take a minute to get a little bit abstract and jump off of two, uh, two things that you were just talking about with um, one of the things that, that brings many people to these movements and protests in the first place is a feeling that they are not in control of the, the government that, that claims to represent them or doesn't, you know, to, to whatever extent that government claims some sort of electoral legitimacy. Um, and at the same time, as you say, um, we're, we're, we're organizing uh, on Twitter, on Facebook, on these private corporations, and you, you talk at length um, about the, the Facebook algorithm, and I don't want to rehash what, what came up in, in the earlier program, but I think that, that, that there might be a sort of parallel that, that is not quite yet there, but, but might be coming down the road, where um, when you look at when you look at people looking at the government and they say, well, there are these hidden there are, there are there are forces that I can't really vote against, or there are, there are, there's part of the government that's in control and it's completely unresponsive to me. And I, I think that when you that that when we look at what the Facebook algorithm is starting is is showing us uh, or not showing us, as you say, people right now don't really know that the Facebook algorithm rhythm is a thing, but my suspicion is that over the next year or two or three, people will, st will start to look and be maybe sort of have the same kind of underlying feelings towards Facebook and social media that they have towards the government, that there's, there's something that's just slightly beyond their control when it comes to, to Facebook. Even if we, even if people don't understand that yet, and I, and I, I wonder if, if you see a, a parallel um, that exists there, or or if you would describe it differently. Um, so, like, I occasionally, I, when I teach, I ask my um, students, "Do you know there's an algorithm in Facebook?" And these are students who are taking my class called New Media and Social Movements, so they're into new media stuff. I usually get one person, two maybe. People don't know, and like, what do you think Facebook shows you? my friend's updates, in what order, in the order they were posted, and what if you don't see something? Uh, I, I say, what, what if, you know, if somebody doesn't respond to you, what do you think? They think it's deliberate. They don't even consider that the algorithm didn't show to people. And I, I teach at a flagship state university. Students are excellent, right? And they're on Facebook a lot. Uh, so the part of it is this is, it's an implicit form of control. 
you, if you change it, Facebook changes it back. <laughs> so if you do it chronologically, it gets switched back to the algorithmic model again. So there's a form of governance there. Rebecca McKinnon wrote this book a couple years ago called Sovereigns of Cyberspace. And I think that's the right sort of concept is that they're kind of sovereign there. And you can, you don't really get a vote and you don't have very sort of formal ways of accountability. You can complain about Twitter on Twitter, I guess, and that's, you know, it's kind of a pastime. But, uh, <laughs> and the, with Facebook, there's not much you can do. People sometimes tell me, don't be on Facebook, but I'm like, how do I not be on Facebook? My, uh, a lot of family members that are elsewhere in Turkey, that's the only communication form they use. They don't even email. Like, I can't really get uh, with them. And so there's this monopoly aspect of it. It's not, if you want to do anything in where I am, I work uh, a lot with refugees. They can use WhatsApp. I don't really have ways of communicating with them without using Facebook tools, to basically. So will there be a moment in which people feel like this is something we don't have control? I don't really know. It's something I write about a lot, and I think it may not be with Facebook that we have this moment of realizing there's these computational decision-making structures that are making decisions for us, and it's kind of implicit and hidden. It may well be when it starts being the employment gatekeeper, because it's coming down the pike. I mean, companies right now, the Fortune 500 companies, they're moving as fast as they can, most of them, many of them, uh, to decision-making systems that are gonna hire by, um, computational decision making, maybe that's what will get people because that's the important thing that people take notice of. I, so I don't really have an answer to will people sort of start seeing this as decisions that are being made about them without their control and privacy. I just saw some polls about the new privacy rollback on ISPs, which hadn't even gotten enacted. So right, we didn't even get the protection for a day before it got re, you know, re repealed. 80, 90% of Americans are like, this shouldn't be law. So there's this huge, like in a country where you couldn't literally have people agree the sky is blue at the moment, they'd be saying the Russians say it or not, right? They'd be arguing whether that was a Russian plot. Uh, <laughs> I, in a moment like that, people are like, yes, are we lost our privacy and control over decision making. So I think this is actually very political. And I don't say this just because it's my topic, although everybody says this about their topic. <laughs> so take that with that. I think this is something worth politically organizing over. This is our infrastructure. This is our collective infrastructure. And it's not just Facebook. But it needs to be a political thing that people organize over before it becomes a thing. And in fact, that's what you see with movements, is that's what movements do. They take something that is subtext and latent, and you say, this is a problem. So until people organize over it, and I write about it a lot when I can, I don't think it will be noticed as a problem. But I think it potentially it's such a significant inflection point in how our society is run, it would be worth one. Will we see one? I don't know. And uh, we'll get to, um, to questions from the audience in just a second here, but as a, as a final question for, for me to you before that, um, I'm curious to hear one thing uh, that you're pessimistic about and one thing that you're optimistic about when it comes to social movements and network protest. Okay, so you guys like know the Gramsci co quote, I pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I am like the sort of the embodiment of this thing. <laughs> I wake up every morning and I'm like, yes, another day I'm alive and the sun is maybe shining. Or if it's not, well, beautiful gray clouds. <laughs> So like personally, I'm a real optimist because I mean every day I talk to, I, I use these tools, I talk to them, it was really, um, like Gezi Park protests, I was in Turkey June 2013 as the protests were breaking out and everyone was waving their phones at me saying, look, we can break censorship, we can do all these things. I checked Twitter and the NSA Snowden revelations were hitting, I'm like, yes, <laughs> we can do all that. But you know what, we're in, you know, the everybody's on their phone that has the um, Turkish citizen ID tied to them and the government has a full list. So there's a surveillance. On the other hand, it's great if you have a million people on the street, that full list is the government's problem. 
And it's kind of like how much money you owe the bank, $10,000, it's your problem. If you owe, owe them a billion dollars, it's really the bank's problem. So there's this great surveillance over all of us. But on the other hand, we can show up and be a million people. You know, what are you going to do with your surveillance? States are resource-constrained actors. Like, you, jailing a million people would, both politically and resource-wise, it is not something that governments can easily do, even the most repressive one. And also, governments don't want to rule that way, because that's not a very efficient way to rule. You know, being North Korea is not what most elites want to do, even if they are on the repressive side. Um, so this, so to give you the optimist and pessimist side, um, the the book, I was almost done with it, and I went to Turkey for a vacation to say, yay, you know, one week I will swim in the beautiful Aegean and be done with the book. Uh, and then <laughs> that I was in Turkey, July of 2016. Uh, I'm sorry, 15, right? Uh, 16. Uh, then the coup happened. So I had started the book and the book proposal years ago saying, what if there had been a coup in the internet? <laughs> so and I found myself caught in a coup with the internet. So it's kind of this funny thing, right? I'm thinking, wow, am I ever getting out of Turkey? And if I'm getting out, do I have to write another chapter? Because <laughs> this, this is not good, I can't really do this. And it ended up, I did get out and you know, Yale was kind enough to give me some more time, so there's a coup chapter. And the coup chapter comes along with the misinformation stuff, right? The current information glut and censorship. So this is something I think a lot about. This is the pessimistic part. Uh, because what I have seen in multiple settings that including sort of what happened with the coup aftermath in Turkey and other places and the current US situation is that we had a problem of information scarcity in the previous world. You know, I, I was a, I worked as a production assistant in Turkey for a while to major um, U.S. and other news channels because it paid really well, and I got to go to places I wouldn't otherwise go. So I've ended up in like the Iraqi border, where we're just the Kurdish area, uh, with a camera. I was probably the only camera within who knows how long. And if we filmed something, it existed. If and we'd have to go to the next city for the uplink, right? There's that. And this is within my lifetime, and I'm not even ready to retire. Right now, the problem is the opposite. There's so much information and so many effective ways to doubt, create doubt, create information glut, create confusion, create um, in passivity. Right? The previous, censors, previous regime of censorship was... Um, you have information and they try to block you from getting the information. Currently, that is not a very effective model and I think many governments and non-government actors have figured out the link to break is between information and action. They can not block you from getting the information, but they can confuse you about it. They can um, distract you. They can sort of bury you in questions and I've seen in many countries, people just get paralyzed by misinformation because you can no longer tell what's what. It's become really difficult. And I think this is the thing that makes me really pessimistic is that this is a hard challenge. This involves everything from Facebook's algorithms to the polarization in the United States uh, and elsewhere in the world to elite failures to uh, the, in the limits of the Enlightenment model. And uh, you know, you, there's anything you want, this problem you know, sort of embodies it. The question of credible information and organizing that makes uh, sense in that. Um, so that, I, and I don't think we have an answer. And I think it's the biggest sort of challenge facing movements because powerful people have to just confuse you. Movements to get positive change, you have to convince people to do stuff. It is much easier to confuse people than it is to convince them to get organized to do things and in a collective way. Um, so it gives the powerful people a really huge tool, or it also gives lots of people a huge tool. It's not just the powerful people to create paralysis, information paralysis, political paralysis. You just give up your hands. Everything's a conspiracy. There are these great powers. It's all a big game, and you're nothing, right? So that creates that. So that's my pessimism. What's my optimism? My optimism is that I've never been more connected to people 
before. I mean, the thing that these things, these little pocket computers allow us to do also is to organize and discuss these things at a scale in ways that we've never been able to do before. And it has equalized a lot of things between the powerful. I mean, the powerful used to just go fly to Davos and they'd speak to one another anyway, right? Uh, which is why I take things like, you know, this is my other hobby, is that I take things like encryption and privacy very seriously, because the powerful will jet around anyway. They will find a way to speak to one another, and it's incredibly important for us to keep being able to speak to each other and to preserve privacy and to be able to sort of have this kind of communication. And if we can keep that, I feel like that's, there's great strength because um, there has probably never been a point in the world where we had this many people connected, wanting better things, broad agreements on lots of things. And to be honest, there are a lot of horrible things going on right now. I'm from the Middle East, so you know, I see heartbreaking pictures all the time. But we don't have a global war. We don't, like, we have climate change, but it's a slow thing. Like, we don't have the 20th century crises. We have minor crises. If we could get the political will and the organizing, we don't really have very complicated problems. There are, you know, the local wars are horrible, and it just, you know, it's pet of my stomach kind of horrible, obviously, and for the victims, it's the worst thing. But all, a lot of the things we discussed, they are solvable, and the only thing missing is political will, organizing, there you go, we got it kind of situation. Um, so that makes me hopeful that the problems aren't like we've got a World War three, hopefully not, right? Th then we can keep talking to one another and think about these things. And if we can swing it and do this, lots of low-hanging fruit for the taking to solve that we could just do, a very rich world. Um, so that's, that's what makes me optimist. So do we have uh, a minute for, um, list or for a question Q&A from the audience? Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, there we go. Uh, a, a whole collection of minutes, probably. So let's, uh, um, uh, hands, what do we got? Thank you so much for your work and speaking about it. I literally can't write fast enough to keep up with what you're saying. Um, I would love to hear you speak a little bit about the power dynamics behind the evolution of these affordances. Mm -hmm. So how the people whose jobs it is to create the means by which other people use these affordances are influenced by the ways um, what they've created gets, gets used maybe unintentionally and are maybe under the guise of neutrality when they create these affordances? So um, it's a great question because obviously there is a small number of people creating these affordances. And I think they're in over their heads, to be honest, partly because the problem space is very complex. I don't see how you couldn't be in over your head if you connected a two billion people. I just don't see the scenario under which that it's not complex. On the other hand, it really is a very narrow slice of humanity that's producing these things. I mean, if you just want to talk, forget race and things and gender that people talk about a lot, they're mostly engineers and geeks. Now that's my tribe too. Like I, I don't want to, but we, we, we're not like my, I, it's like I'm the sort of mixed creature that is part of my tribe, that is part of who I've been, who I am. Like we, we're a tiny slice of humanity. And on top of all of that, they are um, fairly like, I'll give you an example of how this thing uh, uh, happens. Like you remember a couple years ago, Facebook had this, um, it's been a great year things, like it would just compile your pictures, it was yeah, a great it year. it just popped up, yeah. Right, okay, so, one of, this is a sad story. Uh, one of the things that they got really attention to this was um, someone who is actually also a developer who developed CSS, uh, a thing that we use on lots of web pages to, for the formatting and other things. Uh, he had very sadly and very unfortunately lost his daughter to cancer that year. And a lot of us had followed along. It was just this heartbreaking, and he's a blogger too. It was just, and he's part of the community, right? The Silicon Valley, it's not that large, that many people. A lot of people knew him. Heartbreak. So around the holidays, you log on to Facebook, and you're like, this is where you're getting support. You want to talk to people. What did Facebook's It's Been a Great Year algorithm do? 
put a picture of his deceased daughter in a party theme saying it's been a great year. So he wrote this heartbreaking. He's a very nice person. He wrote this very, I know you don't mean to kind of thing. It's not the words that came to my mind. Uh, <laughs> and then your Facebook people were like so sad about it. They apologized a million times, right? This isn't a thing. So how does this happen? I'll tell you how this happens. The Facebook engineering team is 20-somethings, lots of Stanford graduates. They're working at Facebook. They're going to get their stock things vested soon. It's been a great year. <laughs> right? The idea that it's not, it cannot be a great year for two billion people at once. This is just not plausible. And if you're young and a Stanford graduate and you work at Facebook, this might not be your life experience. You don't really need like race diversity or gender diversity or any kind of, you just need more people over 40. I, I mean, literally, like, and they will tell you, you know what, stuff happens. Um, of course, um, there are also a lot of men, and there are also not too many black people or Hispanic people in the engineering team. So there's a lot of other kinds of things. They're also pretty well off. Why did, you know, lots of the people who get to Stanford tend to be from a social class. So there's a huge social class is issue that's not talked about as much as race and gender, but it, to me it's huge. Uh, so then th this is this kind of, do you see what I'm saying? You build a tool and you're imagining yourself as this user. It, of course it's not been a good, uh, there were great examples that came up though. My favorite one was this woman, uh, <laughs> the Facebook picked a picture of her ex-boyfriend's house burning. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a great year. She it's was been a like, fantastic year. <laughs> she was like, that's not too bad, but I, you know, I don't really have it in that much for him. Uh, you know, she was, so there was all these things, people, but of course it has, and then people had lost pets, parents, all sorts of things. You got fired, and Facebook would algorithmically pick the most commented things. Sometimes those are horrible things. So this is a very low-hanging fruit, right? This one, you literally needed to walk off the street, pick a random person, and say, do you think it's been a great year for two billion people? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't need to be making a million dollars and working at Facebook to know the answer to this. So this is an example of how insular they are. On the other hand, the question of what should the newsfeed algorithm show you it really is complex. Like if you gave me the magic wand, I don't have a single answer. I have lots of ideas on what are the things that could be done. But chronological is not necessarily it. That's the obvious one, and we do it with Twitter, and that works for me on Twitter, but like I put an enormous amount of effort to curating my who I follow on Twitter because it gives me more affordances, but I put a lot, like, so this is not the same thing. And it works for me, it works for lots of people, but it makes it harder to use for other people. So chronological is an easy answer, but that's not necessarily right for Facebook. So what is the right answer? It's a very complex space. And I don't think there is a single person that can just give you an answer from the back of their pocket. So what we need is structures of accountability and reflection we need all kinds of more diversity, so it's not people who for whom it's been a great year. You know, it's not the world's not just Disney, and they also all live on the Facebook campus. And the dry cleaner picks up their clothes. It's kind of like this. It's like the how a lot of startups are solving the problems of twenty-somethings who left home, delivers food, picks up laundry, and they're just kind of replacing mom kind of situation. They're very <laughs> insular in that way. So what we need is really this kind of opening up the designers of technology to people. And I don't want, and I say this as a geek, I don't want just more geek women in there because we are also a particular slice of humanity. That's not going to solve it either. You need to be talking to and listening to and learning from People who are not, I, I don't like the everybody learns to code thing. Like, no, because it's a very particular thing. I love it. If I take a sabbatical, I'm just going to hide under a table and write code. I love that. Uh, but, it, you know, you don't, ha you shouldn't have to be the kind of person who likes it to have a sense of ownership and a say in how your digital intermediation occurs. And at the moment, we're nowhere near this. In fact, if anything, things are getting worse and more insular. They need to be s better. So I'll, I'll just kind of leave it there. And as, you, as you write in the book, um, anonymity versus quote unquote real name policy is another one of these very complicated situations where it's not clear that there is a magic bullet or a magic wand. I mean, I, I, I would oppose the real names policy because we shouldn't force names down you know, like that. On the other hand, the I, and I wrote this before, like I wrote this 
six years ago where and I was like, look, pseudonymity is not gonna be great for movements either. And I say this as a like my home social network is Twitter, but it does open you up to harassment more. It I and I you're gonna say, well people with real names can do it too. Well yes and no. There are different affordances and mechanisms how go into it. There are now countries in the world where if you want to join an activist circle, they want your Facebook account because they want to know who you are. And it is a more grounded, offline connected thing than your Twitter thing. But I'm not advocating either one, right? It's really a complex space where people say, you know, and I, I wouldn't like I wouldn't support the real name policy because, you know, sending your government a license ID isn't the solution. But on the other hand, those anonymous spaces or pseudonymous spaces do open people and movements up to infiltration, misinformation, harassment. So how do you deal with that complex space? Um, you know, this is the thing. Like I, I've been doing this for years, but you know, I get this thing. You know, I get this sort of media questions a lot. I mean, with my pundit hat, it's like, is this good or bad? I'm like, yes. <laughs> it's like common answer, but it real. I don't mean it. Like it became kind of a gimmick, but I really mean it. It is very hard to take one thing and say good or bad, because this thing isn't your pony. It's not just going to work for you. Like internet allows, for example, I talk about how you can find people like you to organize when you are feeling marginalized, like you're that Egyptian dissident and you're feeling marginalized, you can find people like you and organize. Well, guess what? It works for neo-Nazis too. <laughs> you know, it's kind of, it's not your pony that's just gonna do one thing. So how do you bring those normative and ethical values to affordances that don't reflect them in the same plane that you're thinking about normative and ethical values? Huge challenge. Another, uh, another, uh, another question. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I'm extremely interested in um, how people use like internet platforms and in, in kind of these ways that you, they take advantage of the affordances and do things that were unintended. I actually gave a talk this weekend about this from like a fine art perspective, um, and I get. Um, I get kind of like in this weird place where I find, I'm trying to think of like how radical is this action? And part of me is like, it's not very because you still are sustaining the platforms. But then the other part of me is that uh, it is because as you gave these examples, especially with like the medical tents um, or the field tents, is like you, you could actually bring about this change that isn't uh, like allowed or doesn't have an opportunity elsewhere. Um, so my, I guess my question is, um, as far as opening up these platforms and radicalizing them or trying to use them for radical change, do you feel that working within the system that already exists is the most effective <coughs> measure? Or do you think that perhaps we should aim to be making new platforms kind of designed from the perspective of minorities and build it up, or both, <laughs> or in between? Well, I, I'm, I, I'm, gonna, like, I'm gonna do the yes thing again. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is such a huge problem and a huge challenge so if you work at one of these companies, I mean, stay and advocate. And if there is something that like starts endangering people's lives, resign and protest and make a lot of noise, right? So I, I'm for like if you're inside, do what you can. And if you see something that is, you know, people's lives are at stake because it's real. Like a lot of times, like especially data retention policies is going to put people's lives at stake. So, but if you feel like it's cross an ethical line for you. I under, you know, this is really, it's very hard to know, like, because I, I don't think stay and advocate inside is always the wrong thing, but sometimes it is. And it's very hard to give a blanket recommendation about where, you know, would you go work with Hitler? Hope not, right? So that's kind of the, obviously you can have examples at the edges that are easy to answer, but it gets very murky very soon. Um, on the other hand, these platforms, you know, you're really smart and you got, you know, your Stanford CS degree and you're just trying to figure out how to make people click on ads. And that really sounds like a lousy job to me, to be honest. Uh, so I don't really like, is that what you want to be? Maybe you could be out there trying to do something, like you could be using your skills to build an alternative. It's not easy to build an alternative. I mean, sometimes people think, oh, we could just do it someplace else. And I think we should try to build alternatives. I think alternatives would help keep the ecology healthier, but at least creating competition. You know what? Things like server downtime and legal issues, and they're going to come up too. Uh, so it's a question too. So I, I, I'm off the 
political organizing, internal organizing, I think tech workers in this particular moment in history have enormous leverage because the co they're, they're, they've got a lot of privilege. If they walk out, the companies are in trouble. So they have enormous internal leverage, unlike other industries. You can be fired easily. It's not, like if you're in a security team on a very major platform, they can't get rid of 20 of you at once. So that means like there's these little pockets of real power that they could help keep the users safer. But on the other hand, you know, you're just figuring out how to make people click on ads and you're in the data science team and that's all you do. And is this really how to contribute to humanity? Or, you know, doesn't sound very appealing to me. <coughs> on the third hand, <laughs> the octopus. You see this with the history of technology again and again and again is that you have this initial phase where everybody's a pirate, you know, kind of bad, uh, what's the right word, it's rebellion, it's cool, and you're sort of this counter thing to power. And the pirate stage very often gives way, this has happened actually with pirates, right? They became the armies of states, they became uh, incorporated into the navies of Britain and all these things. You had the pirates and they were pirates and then they became sort of paid soldiers. And I think with the tech industry, we're moving to the CEO phase. It's very slowly, fastly, whatever. It's moving into this, it's becoming, it is becoming the part of the power structure. Very, I don't mean like it was always powerful, but it's not being um, absorbed fully into the power structure. And at the current moment, its business model and soft authoritarianism fit very well. It's, it's 2017, and the current technology, business model, and infrastructure is perfectly suited to a soft authoritarian mode of governance. Will the companies just sort of sail into this? It's quite plausible. So how do you organize against that? Because to organize against it, you often need these platforms too. So that's why it's a yes. I mean, I think this is a very big political problem. Because uh, you're seeing, I, I give, you know, I, I like history a lot and I give a lot of Leni Riefenstahl examples. This is, uh, you know, any <laughs> history. She was this brilliant filmmaker. She started as an actress, gorgeous woman, uh, and she is like really good behind the camera too. She, she, her cra she was really good at her craft. And she innovated. Just like the tech people are innovating, she innovated a lot of the film techniques. And her masterpiece happens to be Triumph of the Will, right? So you can have people who are very, whose, whose craft is beautiful and wonderful and you end up being the infrastructure for fascism in her particular case. So will the tech industry go that way? It is not implausible despite the professed beliefs of the tech industry itself, right? Because the people in the industry, if you ask them, they have a set of values, the infrastructure they're building is very compatible with a totally different set of values. And how do we oppose this? I think this, these are very political questions and anything anyone can do inside, outside political organizing, create alternatives so that we have places to go to if things get really bad, uh, defend sort of things like encryption, fun things. I, I, I'm, I'm for like, um, What's the right word? Um, for alarm fire? I, I mean, I think this is an emergency, to be honest. I mean, given 2017 where things are at, because it's not, it's going to ossify. If you look at history, the open period of technology being softer and being more manipulable is coming to an end. It's becoming more fully absorbed by power. How do we oppose this? I don't have a single answer, so yes. You're referring in to the uh, digital, what is it, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act that yeah. Right now, the whole thing, right? It, it see, I, to give you a very simple example, like it just, people just notice this, but when you cross the border now, they, the social media checks have become more prominent, yeah. right? And it just brings the question, whoa, look at this data retention policy. Why is 10 years of my life here, right? Is there a way to use Facebook without having Facebook keep 10 years of my life? It is very tedious. You could go and delete your post, but you would have to spend like, a week de deleting your post. And maybe you want to keep some of that. How would you deal with it? Is there a way? Like there's all these things I could design if like if I had the magic wand, 
I could design to give people tools to have different data retention policies that wouldn't make, like the, the, the border made it obvious, but that data is there and it is something that is, again, very compatible with authoritarianism in various forms. Um, so what is the method by which we f force a change in this very significant thing? I don't have a single answer, but it's staring at us. Is that, uh, all right, uh, I think that's gonna do it for this, uh, for this talk. Uh, please give Zainab Tufekci a big round of applause. The book. Yeah. The book is the talk. The book. It's paper. I can't edit it. <laughs> Twitter and tear gas, the power and fragility of network protest. I recommend it very, very highly. Uh, thank you all so much for, for coming. That's, uh, that's the end of uh, Theorizing Web 2017. Thank you all so much. Yeah,